The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for coming. And uh, we have quite a lot of people I haven't seen for a long time and some new friends. Welcome. Oh, lovely. Um, today I'm going to talk about, in, in relationship to what's been happening for me, as I usually do, uh, a subject that many of you know very well and uh, it, technically from the Pali perspective much better than I do, <laughs> but I know it from my own uh, Mahayana tradition and uh, from the Zen practice. But I think, as with all our teachings, it has to really, it really comes to light or the wisdom of it comes to the front when it is connected with what's happening in our lives very directly. And that's what has uh, inspired the talk today. So I've called it Effortless Effort and Maintaining, maintaining the Zeal. It is about the parami of Viryana. Viryana is uh, a perfection with many um, aspects to it, you know, often known as right energy or right effort. Uh, it is also diligence. Um, it sometimes is touched on by what is we call exuberance, but that's really a, a cousin that has other connotations to it. But we'll talk more about the different facets of it and how it is related to my um, story very recently. But to start with, I'm finding what's very useful is a little meditation, a contemplation to bring us into this perspective, this space. Um, so we just, it's not going to be very long, just five minutes to settle us, bring us here and be present with this under, or deepening this understanding of Irina. Mm. So I want you to just uh, contemplate where you may have been a little challenged. We've just had what is called a supermoon, and I think that brings up a lot for people. And yet you felt very strong. So we're not looking at the, the, the difficulty of that challenge other than how it brought out some quality in you that was strengthening and enabling and it helped to deepen a, a sense of, a deeper sense of your character and your courage. Something that comes to mind, a recent encounter or situation. And in this, you felt a, a heart of a boundless energy or energized through this situation, inspired, encouraged. It may reflect on different aspects of what's going on in your life at the moment. In a way that shows you what perhaps covers or prevents this open-heartedness when you are inspired and out of a difficulty and to act, or to be kind, to help others, help yourself, somehow this strengthens us. And puts a spotlight on our attachments to things our expectancy that they will stay and remain as they are, or our fixed views. We 
we may notice when we're generous and we're giving of ourself in whatever capacity or in materiality, that it also gives rise to various strength in a protective way. It's called ama. In this recent situation, Look at what was virtuous about it, or purifying, or how your practice grew from it. It might have been coupled with the practice of repentance, or a ritual, or an interaction with a teacher, or an inspiring text. But there is always something when we have difficulty that inspires us to understand it more deeply and find ways to let it go. Just keeping in our mind, the back of our mind, that situation, and hopefully it is further nourished through this little talk today. This situation would have required a lot of attention, a lot of your energy, or effort, or exertion in some way, even mental. And it is actually, in the Sanskrit term, the virya, it means a hero. It means that you surmount it, you overcome it, you grow from it. And you understand it deeply. And it is through this recognition and growth that what is called armor or protection or purification has a, a strength. It's like a barrier. It's like something that gives you the ability to move into other difficult situations. With great zeal and energy. And it often has an attitude of joy and feeling happy about engaging in this. Knowing what comes out of it is wholesome, is better than before. You can continue in meditation, or you can just relax and continue to listen. What I notice uh, that sharpens 
whenever I've been encouraged to be more courageous or more fearless and face myself and face the situation as myself, other as myself. But what happens is there is an integrity and an honesty that surfaces in the mind. This is what gives us or empowers us with the strength to not feel burdened and overwhelmed, but inspired by a new challenge. And I will speak to that in my situation. But the foundations of this virya, or the foundations of right effort and energy come from restraining, restraint, and relinquishing or letting go, and at times even an abandonment, turning away from. So we're turning away from those negative dialogues we have when something doesn't work for us, or the fear reactions. And we start to turn into the present moment with greater attention, greater focus. Prior, this parami of Kanti is the one, uh, sorry, prior the um, parami of Virya is the one of Kanti, or what we say in Mahayana, from the Sanskrit shanti, meaning patience. So the patience is what holds the energy and stabilizes our capacity, our mental and physical capacity to endure. It's what we build on from the other parami of generosity and keeping the precepts developing our patience, it brings up a lot of new growth. I touched on what we sometimes refer to as a, a close enemy. <laughs> it seems very similar, and it might be uh, intoxicating or ex excessive beginner's enthusiasm. But this is something that we, we all have at times, but it's not very last, long-lasting. Anything that is intoxi intoxicating is going to burn itself out. Beginner's enthusiasm, it doesn't take very much to puncture that with something that someone says or a displeasure. Many of us, when we first come to the temple, we're very in inspired. It was out of the pain or the suffering we come. And then something inspires us, as I've talked about in recent talks, that engages us to keep coming. But this bubbly sort of effervescence is just like a bubble pops. It doesn't last very long. So we have to develop the deeper essential meaning of this power of energy. I recalled um, when I was in Korea many years ago, living in a hermitage, that the village women would come up once or twice a year and we would work together to cut all the grass at the back of the hermitage because bushfires and snakes and so forth. And we would go up this very steep hill, but nothing bothered these women. They were always 
full of joy and full of energy. Didn't matter how hard they taught me how to use this sickle, this scythe, little hand scythe, and you crawl along on your, your haunches, on your, your ankles and your feet, low to the ground, and you're just slicing in the moment what's in front of you, in a certain movement, in a certain rhythm. And I learned from these ladies at the time that if you do whatever it is you do, in doesn't matter how physically difficult it may appear, if you do it in a rhythmic pattern, that you're breathing naturally, your body and hands are functioning with the tool at hand, and you're engaged, fully engaged in that action and those you're with, there is this sort of a group empowerment. They would go all day from my place to another's, another job. Early in the morning, all of you who come from ethnic cultures, you know, you know this. You know how your parents were taught from children to handle their, utilize the skills that their grandparents had passed on to them in a way that was nourishing for the whole, for everyone, not an individual. And because of this, there is a sort of an outpouring of the heart, an opening, a sense of wanting to do it well and to share it and to be more generous. So uh, many of these things came to mind this last week when other things were also happening. <laughs> we say in Zen, we take the next step completely, fully, completely. We also breathe and taste and touch in a wholehearted practice of completeness. We fulfill each moment, each action. touching, tasting. Whatever we are experiencing, we do it completely. That's what you learn from mindful walking. Take each step, you place it, you lift it, you move it forward, place it, lift it. And this is what it's teaching us. So I'll touch on this, uh, my story a little bit. Um... <laughs> I was asked to do a little project at my property. A group of Vietnamese wanted to offer a, a beautiful Quan Yin, and my committee were a little hesitant <laughs> because the little Quan Yin was, they wanted a five meter little Quan Yin. <laughs> and of course, you know, raising the money is a tiny part of it. <laughs> and um, so I said, well, we, one is I don't think the council is going to allow me to have a five-metre Kuan Yin on the property um, and the construction would be a lot of money apart from, you know, the building of it and transport and so forth. So they reduced it to a two-metre, just over two-metre, because that was allowable without a permit. And for them, that's all they thought about, make a few meals, sell a you know, sell a little food, make some money. And then they created, I think, 5,000 or something. And then the uh, Venerable Phuc Thanh, um he wanted to put it near the pond because when he saw the design, he said, oh, it has to go near water. And I thought, oh, we we're just going to put it up near the house in the little new garden where there wouldn't be so much work but the water, the pond, we have to fix up the pond. So Venerable Fuktan said, well, I'll give you 5,000 to fix up the pond. So this is where it all starts, you know. And there's little me sitting on my property having to <laughs> get the labour and the materials and, 
and think about how we can get the weeds out of the pond. The pond, a third of the pond was covered in this very, very strong matted weed. The carpet of the weed was very thick. So we had a machine come that we excavated out for the plinth and we got the concreting done and we made paths and designed places for gardens. So that first half of that money had gone. And then we thought, well, you know, 5,000 will do the pond. But when we came to doing the pond, we were very careful because it's a big excavator with a big claw. I said, now we have to just put the back of the excavator up and not have the claw anywhere near the plastic membrane. And for a while it worked. We were both, I was very attentive, and, you know, saying how far it could go down and how to lift it out. And big clumps of this stuff came out and we got a little confident, overzealous, you might say. We were energised, we were enthusiastic. The bubbles were happening <laughs> both in the water and in ourselves. And then at one point I saw a bit of plastic rise up with the, <laughs> with the matting. And I said, oh, no, it'll be fine, you know, it, would, it, it will seal itself. I was sure the pressure of the water would seal it. Then up came a bigger clump, even with the carpet that was underneath the plastic. I thought, oh, this is looking more serious. But I still had this positive, you know, because I'd been feeling, oh, all that weed, you know. It, the weed was taking up a quarter of this hall. All that weed has gone. And the pond looked so much larger and I was starting to envisage what it's going to look like and the lilies would look better and so forth. Anyway, by the end, he went home. He was very nervous and very frightened that he, <laughs> he destroyed the pond and I kept saying, oh, don't worry, you know. And he went home and, of course, the next morning the pond <laughs> was a little puddle in the middle and there were five quite major holes in it. Well... I still was positive, so I spent time Googling and I went and bought some new membrane to put over it and I bought something that they said was a good tape. Well, the tape, we came back and we did a semi-underpatch and, uh, and he was still, you know, because he's an excavator man here having to repair a pond and he was very out of his comfort zone and getting very anxious and very agitated, and I kept soothing him and giving him confidence, and I was there working with him. And, and we had another, our Adam, who comes every week to do gardening and work. He was working away at the back, also taking out weeds. Very quietly, he didn't get phased at all. He didn't get engaged in it. <laughs> and this one person was, you know, you could feel that stress rising. So... I cut everything and I said, well, the tape we've bought's not going to work. I'll go and have a look for a stronger glue. We found we could get it locally and we started to move forward. It took a whole day just to cover three patches and the next day to do one or two others. But at one point on the second day, it was he must have been sleeping on it and worrying about it all night that he said, this is not my job. <laughs> I said, oh, no, but it's something we can all do, you know. So it, I learned something there in that had I been anxious or negative from the beginning and, oh, what's happened? What have you done? You know, how did this happen? But I didn't. And I could very, clear, very clearly see the causes for why it happened. It was a very reasonable option that this would go, would go this way. And I could also see the pain of him, because that's me at other times. You know, at times I'm out of my depth. We're all out of our depth, and we react very differently. You have a child who's getting involved in something, you get very concerned, very anxious. In this case, he was like my child. <laughs> but it brought out 
that precondition to virya, patience in me, in a way that was very felt in a very new way. It was not a patience, an idea of it, or a tranquility, or a meditation state. It was a stability of mind, a capacity to hold a situation as it was with what was happening. And there was a very large pile of uh, cut um, foliage that we'd been trimming trees. And Adam, the other labourer, said, look, we'll go and start to burn this pile. He went off to burn it. And so we had this situation where... (laughs) where the pond was empty and there's a big fire going on over here. (laughs) Interesting elementals. (laughs) That night, I came out to push the timbers right in to the centre of the fire so they would all burn. And the full moon followed me through the trees. And when I got to the fire pit, it was on my shoulder. I turned around and it was the way it was sitting on the rise of the property next door. It sat on my shoulder. It were, you know, one of those, oh my goodness, you know, almost a blessing. <laughs> the power of this full moon. And here I was with the fire in, on this side, the tranquility and the It was a very strong full moon. It's actually what they call a scorpion full moon. And ironically enough, in astrology, my full moon is in Scorpio. But scorpion full moon, it is also the full moon of relinquishing, letting go. Anything that hasn't worked, it's gone. So too in this whole situation of the pond emptying, it actually turned out to be very good because we were able to patch all the, more, add more rock to the wall, tidy it up, take all the weeds out around it and start afresh. And with the, uh, the, this beautiful big Kuan Yin, little Kuan Yin, <laughs> it's big for me, that's going to sit poised over this bond. You know, even the thought of it suddenly started to become very present and very real out of this situation. So I was very energised. I came back. It was late, but I still was so energised. I went and had a, a good long sit, just came inside, peacefully sat as if that day was a very fulfilling day. Now, had we taken the weed out, not penetrated the plastic membrane, not burnt the pile of... (laughs) Because we had other other trees to, to cut, we weren't going to do it that day. But if we hadn't, one of those conditions hadn't been there, circumstances are very different. And life is like this. You know the the wonderful Tibetan story of of the ups and downs of a man's life, you know. This happens and, oh, the village goes, oh, no, and that happens, oh, what a blessing. And this happens and, oh, no, you know. And then he's off to, supposed to go off to the army and then he breaks his foot and he can't go to the army. Oh, what a blessing, you know. <laughs> Life is like this. But can we somehow find a way to develop this stability and equanimity and consistency in our life? even when great problems come. I mean, I've touched on this in other stories when I talked about the woman who was always grizzling and complaining, the 
husband was having affairs and the children were playing up and the, everything was always a problem and she always went to the monk and sat for an hour complaining about her problems. And one day he said, hold this one thought, it doesn't matter. Or we say never mind, quen chaneo, never mind. Never mind, don't engage, don't hold on to it, don't push it away, just be present with it. And she took up this practice, because in Korea it's a very, you know, quen chaneo is a very simple word they use all the time. It's okay, quen chaneo. Never mind, quen chaneo. <laughs> it's a word that <laughs> encompasses many things. And as she held this mind, everything started to change. The husband noticed she was not angry with him all the time. And he started to stay home more. <laughs> One day the neighbour came and said, your child's fallen in the pond. And she said, Quen Chanayo, you'll be fine. Don't worry. You've noticed the kid's, kid's fine. The kid was fine, of course, in this situation. It's not always the case. But <laughs> so her life and her actions changed because she found a way to focus her mind in the moment, that things in the moment were okay. Her energy changed, she lifted, and one day she was making pancakes and she had the, the oil in the pan boiling and she threw in some of the dough and it splattered up. And as she, that happened, she was awakened. She threw the pan down and danced around singing Quen Chaneo, Quen Chaneo. Everyone <laughs> had thought she'd really gone off the, <laughs> off the planet. But in a way, you know, this, is, this was a true story actually. In a way, this is something that if we have a meditation practice, if we develop the parami, if we come regularly, we start to gain that strength and stability, that courage and equanimity. And that will found the mind for not only endurance, but energy and right effort will follow. Mm. The moment when we think of uh, India and the current tragedy of the COVID crisis there, you know, we all have very deep concerns also in Sri Lanka and other countries that have not been able to address the situation so well. Yet, for all the, the doctors, the nurses, the, the social workers, the, even the grave diggers and <laughs> the people who are having to handle every aspect of this situation, without this, you know, these are ordinary people, they know nothing about Dharma, without having developed some capacity to do their job and face all this suffering without becoming numb or without that self-fear that must always be there, you know, constantly rearing its hell head. They could not sustain that capacity to help others. But it tells me we all have that. Put in that situation, we all have it. We all know how to apply ourselves. It's an F becomes an effortless effort, is the word we use. An effortless, effortless effort. I won't say it too many times. <laughs> it become a pattern of speech. 
Mm. But when poor John was, the excavator driver, was faced with the holes, he, he felt like that hole. He felt he was sucked into it. He felt inadequate. His program, the way he thinks, just a little hole, I, I said, just a little hole. We, we can patch this. If it doesn't work, you know, the worst is if it doesn't work, we have to remake the dam, the pond. That's the worst. Oh, that, that wasn't the right thing to say, but <laughs> that is the reality. The worst, we have to start again. And many of you have had to start again many a time. Many a time. And if we do it right, it's okay. We know how to do it the next time. But I also realized I had to be very gentle. As he was tired and stressed, we were all tired. It's the way the, you know, when you, <coughs> you can't think how to work out a problem or think ahead, you know, it's you get caught in the waves. You're no longer the ocean that just embodies and holds the situation. You become caught in the, sur the surface of the mind. And one of the aspects of really penetrating deeply into this parami is the capacity to go beyond this fluctuating, thinking, working out, quandary of the way we utilize our mind. We always have this stream of mental engagement that we take so very seriously. But actually, to tap into the deep waters, tap into that deep energy, we have to go beyond that, which of course takes us into the deeper emotional body, the feeling body. And still, we have to have the capacity to be with what's going on on these deeper levels before we can still penetrate into the the conscious the, the deep consciousness of clarity and flow For me, the leaking pond was not the problem. <laughs> Much more so the leaking physical energy. <laughs> At one point, I was even running. I don't know when I've been last running. Because <laughs> the pond's a little way to my property. So <laughs> suddenly, the situation empowered me to, to get moving because we were trying to work out what to do. We put aside, you know, the unhelpful objectives, the unhelpful thoughts, and we focus our mind in what it is we can do that does make a change, that can, just little by little, that can work for us. <coughs> I always write lots of notes. I don't know where, where they'll all go one day, but <laughs> when I'm thinking, you know, I'm putting this down and that. So anyway, energy is um, in its, it's really what we would say is ocean-like capacity. It is always very fulfilled when it's in connection to others. It is caring. It is an energy of um, 
giving ourselves in some way and sharing in some way and fulfilling the needs of others in some way. This is where it is not a, in any way a, a light energy. It becomes a very sustaining force that motivates our life and our practice. And it grows. In a sense, it's what patches the dam of the mind. You know, it patches all those those holes where our life seeps out in a way that we can feel always full and always there in a capacity that offers ourselves in some way. It might be a kind word or a hand or it might be in the dam filling a hole. But it is, energy is much more than just this. It's been there long before I've been here. It will continue long after I go in some way. It's all of life. So the effort aspect of virian, viria is the containment or the channeling or the directing of it, the using of it, the purpose, purposing of it. And this is where the balance and persistence and patience It is always the action of loving kindness and compassion. And it is a noble emotion. It's a clarifying of the mind. And it motivates the uh, volition or the intention to be enlightened. That is its deepest cause. It motivates the volition or intention to awaken, wake up. So for a Zen practitioner it is, and for any practitioner of Dharma or other traditions, it is connecting to every situation with courage to act in a kind and caring way, in helping and supporting others in whatever need arises. So the Buddha asked us to inquire in regards to intention and action. He said it is for my welfare and the welfare of all. It leads us out of this stress and it brings more peace to the world. So I'm always happy to engage in things that challenge me. I think living in a forest on my own, you know, I'm always challenged. Every day I never know what's going to fall off where or <laughs> what's going to rise from where or... <laughs> Whether it's bushfires or floods, we don't know. Another aspect, going further with the energy, where is this energy to be directed? It's to develop the concentration for medita meditation. It's to take us to develop wisdom. There's a primary purpose of the paramis is to bring us to the place of wisdom. But without energy, it is very hard to sustain the concentration. It's hard to sustain mindfulness and present attentive awareness of mind.
It's only then that the ocean of our worries and doubts, our moods and our feelings, can be realized, looked into, to see where they come from. What is driving them? What is motivating them? What is enabling these deeper currents of our life? Pema Chodron, a wonderful nun in the Tibetan tradition who's written many books, she has this to say, there are many defences shielding our heart. So now we have to remove all the defensiveness, so much so that we are able to love everyone in this universe. That heart is the bodhicitta, that heart is the heart of the Buddhas, the heart of the Bodhisattvas. It is the heart without any defensiveness. Can you imagine that? We can have a heart without any defensiveness. A heart without the need to defend. The need to control the need to choose. Yeah. You know, how much of the time and energy do we spend in a day choosing? We wake up in the morning, will I have wheat bix or will I have rice bubbles or will I have eggs? It goes on from, from, from <laughs> very early in the morning. And it doesn't take very much when we have this mind that's already getting a little bit, you know, all about itself, for that to be taken off balance at some point. Something that's going to be said. Just simple little things. So I'm going to hold the image of this dam in my mind, this pond, I keep calling it a dam, it's, it's quite large probably half the size of this room. Because it has taught me so much. John has taught me so much. Adam, who, who I have never, in 17 years of him coming to do work, have I ever seen him angry? Can you imagine? He's seen me. <laughs> He's seen my moods. <laughs> but... <laughs> I've always said, I don't know, Adam, the Buddha picked someone really special to come and help me here. He has a wife who has always a lot of illness and problems. He has some Chinese history in his great-grandfather, I think it is, you know, just that nothing is too hard for him. And that day it was hard for all of us, and he was shining, just shining. So next time we face a difficulty, just allow yourself to open and, wow, what am I doing here? See how you engage. See how your emotions unfold. See how, look at your reactions. Not changing anything, we don't have to change anything. You're not seeing Jiguang who is a Buddha. You're seeing Jiguang as a human. Far from that level yet. <laughs> I just happen to have a bald head and wear robes. To it, it is my support. But I want to thank you. Um, there might be, oh, not too bad a timing, a little bit early, but might be time. For a question or two? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, so, uh, given that we've all been through this COVID-19 crisis, 
Um, I found talking to many people that many of us struggled with the loneliness and disconnect. And uh, in Buddhism, there's this idea of guarding the senses and sense desire. And that was, I think, particularly tricky for some of us. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to ask, how do we sort of relate to the parts of the mind that want that go against our spiritual practice? Um, so deep desires to engage in stuff that might not be so wholesome. Well, you know, your spiritual practice is that too. You know, it's not something separate. Yeah. You know, when we, we say guarding the mind, we're saying, you know, looking at it very honestly, very openly, watching it, watching how it moves, watching what it does. At some point you will notice all those thoughts and emotions aren't you. At some point, you know, they rise out of conditions as they pass away out of conditions. COVID was a very difficult time for everybody and people acted in unusual ways. For me, I found a project to do and I still remained engaged. I didn't see people except Adam came once a week, but we didn't, we weren't close, you know, he did his work. Um, but you know, I can't say that there weren't inner feelings of, you know, what you, you mentioned, the loneliness or the sense of isolation or the lack of touch, you know, elderly people, just touch was a, a, a difficult thing to do and have. But... Um, we, when we study Dharma, one of the things that we do start to see, you know, in the initially we have, you know, what to do, what not to do. But as you start to study, you, you see this is a, a training to understand your mind, to understand who you are, as you are. The rest of it, as you see it clearly, it changes. Sometimes you're patching, but you're not patching. You know, like what you're saying is that using the Dharma to protect. Sometimes just being who you are in, in a very open, kind, generous-hearted way, in connection, in non-reactive, Allowing, you know, the thoughts to be there but not acting on them is, is the beginning of it. We can't push things away and not inviting them either. You know, we didn't invite the damage to the pond. It was, when, once we saw it, it was inevitable. There was a sort of a wall in there, so the machine got too close. Of course, it's going to pick up something. But we're like that. Hmm. Any more questions? Everyone's quite <laughs> content or fulfilled today. <laughs> well, if this is the case, we'll end it here. So um, there is one online question. Yeah, sure. It is, how does one know or identify your limits when applying effort? Mm. It's a very good question. I mean, that is all part of uh, what you're applying effort to and your capacity in that situation of uh, engagement. But there is this, that near cousin I talked about, which is something that comes out of more of an intoxicating mind, state of mind, which is something that we get very elated or very joyful or very energised, playing sports, you get very energised. But even in sport, you have to know very skillfully when to play and when not to play, when to act and when to be still. 
and it is a matter of developing that capacity to know when and what to do. But it's also, I mean, younger people do have this tremendous um, energy. A lot of it is just physical energy. But energy is a much greater thing than just this physical body. And uh, how the, the right effort is how do we work with it? And where do we channel it? What's the objective? What are we doing and why are we doing it? Where are we putting ourselves at every moment? As I mentioned, you know, fully walking when we're walking. A lot of the energy is just dissipated through our dreams and our desires. And especially as we get older, that's what wears us out, our worries, our concerns. And for young people, it's not getting enough, you know. <laughs> how can I get more of whatever it is I like? And how quickly can I get it? So there is a matter of how do we channel it? Where do we put it? Where do we place it? What is it for? So it's all part of that development of the pre right energy or right effort. It is part of this, um, the, the, that enduring or equanimous or patience that comes in that stage before. If we're enduring, we're over excelling ourselves, something will get exhausted. And that's probably why the pond ended up empty in my case. Something was exhausted. The car ended up dying. <laughs> Something's exhausted. <laughs> Didn't touch on the car, but another day. <laughs> it been actually, it was a bomb. All my cars have been, you know, a few dollar bombs since I've been back from Korea. <laughs> this was the cheapest one, and it's, it's been actually not too bad. But... You know, I have felt some exhaustion, probably putting too much out for some time. And then when somebody suggests what might seem, oh, wonderful idea, without recognising who's going to make this happen, then, of course, the energy is bleeding out. So there is, we have, that goes to yours. We have to know how to protect it. That's the wisdom. That's where wisdom comes in, and until we actually are in abundance of wisdom, we may not <laughs> always do it right. Yeah. So, well, thank you, everybody, and I wish you a lovely day. It's a beautiful day. Haven't we been lucky? Sunim, so, sorry. Another Again. one. Again. <laughs> oh, there's one more. <laughs> That's okay. People want to tap into your wisdom. Mm. And this is an interesting one. And Namaste. My parents, when they fall sick, they come to our house to get well. Mm. They rummage everything of our lifestyle. They what? Rummage. They I guess they just me mess, mess it up or criticise it or cause a lot of problems with our lifestyle and then go back <laughs> home. <laughs> How to deal with this? <laughs> I don't think there's anyone here that <laughs> who fall into that category, is there? <laughs> I can hear all the laughter back there. <laughs> Sounds like grandparents who go, go to, the, to, to look after the grandkids, you know, <laughs> and give them lots of sweets <laughs> and, and feed them things the parents would never feed them. <laughs> Even, you know, I almost got expelled from my nephew's house for <laughs> being somewhat perceived of that sort of, I might, I don't know, inspire the children in some way they didn't want. <laughs> I'm very careful of that. <laughs> but uh, what can you do when, you, when your parents come? Well, what do you do in any situation that's, not particularly pleasing. 
Again, it comes back to much of what I've talked about. To actually, I mean, the ultimate would be if you didn't want to invite them, and that would, obviously, that's not what you want to do. So there either needs very clear <laughs> guidelines or instructions or sitting down and conversations. But energy-wise, you know, the grandparents enjoy coming to their children's home. This is a natural. The children, the grandchildren, love going to the grandparents' home. It's a natural. Anyone watching that, what is it, the four-year-olds and the... Uh, uh, we learn a lot from that show, don't we? It's, I found it very, very educational. But obviously there, there is not enough... Uh, of that feeling of connection, that feeling of um, of kindness or respect in both cases here. It's, it's a deep, personal, emotional situation that would have a lot more baggage than we would ever recognise. But again, it's a situation of taking some responsibility. We had to take some responsibility, make a decision with the dam as to which way forward. And I had to make a very clear decision. We would do it this way. And with a person who is inviting someone, you have to remember your home is your home. You have certain boundaries and, reg you know, regulations with your home, but your family is also family. So you have to find that balance between the two. Its situation is not so much about energy, but it's the right effort. How much effort do we put in before this erupts into something much worse? How much effort do we apply? What wisdom do we apply? What equanimity and patience do we apply? so that this situation is workable. I mean, there'd be many people, anyone in this room, have an understanding where boundaries, there's a whole area that I haven't touched on today on boundaries and how to work within boundaries and how to set up and protect oneself with boundaries. That's what the precepts are for. That's what even loving-kindness meditation or meditation is for. But certainly right speech and right actions come clearly into this situation. But we are always responsible. Everything that happens in our life how we react to it is our responsibility. And do we generate more kindness, more trust, or do we create more separation, more angst, more fear? Whatever we do is our responsibility. It's a difficult, that's one you need the person sitting in front of you. <laughs> to, to really address. <laughs> yes, yeah, so is that the last one now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, you might be able to offer something a little bit better to that, having, having grandchildren or whatever. The problem is that person has a very strong opinion of what they have, what they are, and what they want. Yes, that's And if right. they practice what you said earlier, it does not matter. There's no problem there. So. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Chai. Very, very clear. But most people, young people, when they have a home, they build a home. I have a nephew who's just rebuilt his home or refurbished his home. And he is very clear exactly what they want. I can't give anything because they don't want it. <laughs> you all know that. <laughs> Not a thing. I thought, oh, maybe I could give a vase of that colour or something, you know. They don't want it. So we... 
we have generation of people who know exactly what they want, and we don't, we don't quite fit into that, do we? <laughs> but we can work on how we can and in what capacity. But thank you very much, and uh, <laughs> thank you for your engagement in the talk. It was lovely.